Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today on the webinar with James Bartram, hosted by Adara from Sustainet Group. A little background about us before we start. Sustainet Group is a nonprofit organization with the vision to empower the next generation of sustainability leaders to take actions and scale impact with the support of a community of mentors. We know that to solve the tough problems we're facing now, the world needs exponentially more change makers. And we need leaders like yourself to step up and lead initiatives. And we need you to learn faster from the current practitioners and be even more effective. That's why we're hosting a webinar series as part of our initiatives to build a community of change makers. Joining us today is James. And without further ado, welcome James and Nadara. Awesome, thanks for the intro, Wen. So, hey everyone, I'm Adara. I'm 17 years old, um, and I'm one of the innovators at SustainEd. Um, for the past year, I've been doing research in carbon sequestration and other climate innovation areas, and I'm really passionate about anything related to the environment, also the ocean, so I'm excited to be interviewing James today. Um, here's a little intro about James as well. So James Batram is the Vice President for Education and Youth at OceanWise, a nonprofit that includes the Vancouver Aquarium. OceanWise is an organization that strives to inspire the global community to increase their understanding, wonder, and appreciation for our oceans. They also run the coolest ocean education program through the Vancouver Aquarium, multiple regional offices, and significant ocean literacy presence online. James is a social entrepreneur who has a long history of helping nonprofit organizations raise millions and scale their impact exponentially. As the founding education director at Jasper National Park, he secured $20 million in funding for a national outdoor school. In a similar position at the Canadian Wildlife Foundation, he boosted their education program outreach from 500 to 117,000 students in just 18 months. James believes that capacity for change is important, but building that capacity is more than just skills or knowledge. He's a leader in initiating a social movement of people who are better and faster at creating innovative solutions for a future centered around sustainability. So I'm really excited to be introducing James today on our webinar. Um, the way that this is going to work is first, we're gonna do a really quick hot seat um, just like some simple questions to warm everything up. Um, I will also be dropping right now, we have a menti pool for all of our viewers. And if you're watching, just drop some of your favorite key takeaways from this webinar today. And we'll be sending out a word bubble at the end in an email of all the key takeaways people put together. Um, so we'll be starting with hot seat, going into just some questions about um, James, James's story, some of the things that he's learned um, and some more. And we we'll also take audience questions. So put some in the chat. And if you have any questions, um, we'd love to ask those as well. So starting off with hot seat, um, James, what is Pacific or Atlantic Ocean? Uh, definitely Pacific. Wait, why? <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I think, uh, I think the Pacific uh, has a more spiritual connection to people. And I think the Atlantic has a more utilitarian uh, sort of industry, agriculture connection to the ocean. And um, winter or summer? Uh, winter, I guess. Cool. Um, what's your favorite animal? Bear. Bear? Okay. And what is your favorite hobby? Uh, I like to, I like construction, I like building things, usually out of wood. We want to start off with just diving into some of your story, um, and we'd love to hear it from you and like your perspective as well. So if you could just give us a bit into your background growing up and then to kind of where you are now. Um, and also we'd love to hear how you were kind of like sparked to get into environmentalism or even the social entrepreneurship side of things as well. I think, you know, I grew up in the UK. I grew up in the industrial bit in the middle of England. Uh, so I'm not particularly connected to nature. Um, but honestly, I think one of the key things for me was uh, getting involved in scouts as a young boy and just having those social experiences in nature with my peers and stuff. Uh, and thinking about community service. Um, so when I finished high school, I didn't, I didn't really plan to go to university. I, I wasn't planning on doing any more schooling. I didn't particularly enjoy school. Um, and then I did some quite terrible jobs and decided actually maybe I should go to university and uh, try and do something else. Um, so initially I went to school to be a teacher and I taught uh, design technology, construction and fabrication and those kind of things in high school. And it just really allowed me to travel. You know, so I just really loved, being, you know, and I worked in lots of different schools in lots of different countries. And it was a great opportunity to be an educator and travel the world. Um, 
and all my hobbies were like kayaking and climbing and mountain biking and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I got into, you know, conservation education or environmental education when the opportunity came up to essentially make my hobby my job. Um, so that was an interesting kind of uh, opportunity. Um, and I think maybe the social entrepreneur piece, um, my sort of, my parents, like my family business, uh, my dad ran a garage and sold used cars and stuff like that. So kind of growing up in a space where it was very normal to kind of hustle and create opportunities uh, was quite different to a lot of my friends in the kind of nature conservation space. And, and so I think that kind of gave me a little bit of an edge in terms of uh, being a bit of an entrepreneur. Cool, yeah. And I definitely want to learn more about the social entrepreneurship part too. And I think a lot of our young viewers might as well. Um, so can you tell us a bit, for anyone who doesn't know, what is social entrepreneurship all about? And what would you say it looks like inside of the environmental space? So my, I, I'd say my definition is, you know, I'm more interested in making a difference than making money. You know, I happen to be quite organized and I'm quite good at kind of finding reciprocity, finding the win-wins between different kind of sectors and organizations and individuals. So kind of in that creative space. Um, so for me, it, it just, there's a lot more fulfillment in kind of building something, creating something something and just working yourself out of a job you know so my sort of career when I was a high school teacher by the time my kids graduated I should be irrelevant they shouldn't need me anymore I mean it's nice if they're you know interested in staying in touch but like it's the job of a, the schooling system to work yourself out of a job so I just applied that when I moved into the environmental space and you know my job now is to you know create opportunities for young people who are smarter, faster, better than me. Um, and now I kind of tend to teach organizations rather than individuals, but it's the same kind of principle. Cool. So um, kind of the theme of our webinar today is keeping strength when fighting a specific cause. Um, and something that I wanted to ask was, what were some big challenges that you had to overcome when you were either scaling one of your projects or when you're working on just anything in social entrepreneurship, because it's not like a, an area where there's an exact process to do something. Like you said, you have to hustle and figure it out as you go um, when working in those kind of things. So how did you overcome any of those challenges or what kept you going when things got harder? I think there's a few things. I mean, first of all, be aspirational. You know, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but honestly, it's so much easier to raise a million dollars than it is to raise a thousand dollars. You know, so aim big, aim high, you know, be aspirational. You know, I think there's big money out there for big ideas, but I think, you know, it's really hard when you're getting started competing with lots of other folks. Um, so aiming big is important. I think finding your crew or your tribe is really important. And so I would sort of say there's probably 20 or so people globally that, my kind of safety net sounding board you know they're the people you can talk to when you know a lot of the time it's not going your way you know <laughs> a lot of the time it's a slog and it is really hard you know folks that aren't in the social entrepreneurship space or they're not in the sort of non-for-profit sector or you know it's hard for them to empathize you know, so I, I've been very fortunate to kind of, as I've traveled around and worked for different organizations, I've kind of come in contact with, you know, friends of mine that kind of have a similar worldview and share similar values, but, you know, very few of them live in the same city or even the same country. So I think, you know, making the effort to stay in touch with those folks and use the technology and like share ideas and stuff, that's that like building that resilient network is you know, really critical. And I think also those networks have to be, you know, really diverse and they have to be brutally honest, you know? So I think something that really helps me is that 
I'm fortunate to have developed like, you know, friendships and relationships across geographies and cultures and sort of so different socioeconomic groups. And that gives me a huge advantage over like other folks who work in similar jobs in other charities who their entire social circle and their professional circle is the same. You know, it's the same kind of people they went to university with, for example, and they don't perhaps have friends who work in manual jobs or, or in different um, social settings. Awesome advice. Yeah, I think some of my takeaways from that is to like aim high, have those big aspirations, but also um, be like relentless enough to stick with it and keep going when it, because it's going to be hard at first, um, for sure. And also to build that tribe, whether it's like mentors or your network, um, because it's always really important. Um, so moving into kind of finding that cause that you want to fight for, what tips would you give to someone um, who is looking for their cause to fight for initially? I think, and, the, and again, there's sort of lots of complementary pieces. So I'll give you an example. You know, I really, you know, I think I've personally really benefited from having the opportunity to get out into nature, experience wilderness, understand a little bit about our kind of human relationship with other species and sort of you know, get value out of that. And there's like nearby neighbors, you know, so my friends in indigenous communities might not describe that in the same way, but it's almost inherent in who they are that they appreciate the reciprocity between humans and other species. So they, but they might just present it in a different way. Um, so I think, yeah, finding that stuff that, you know, you're passionate enough about, but that, and that is, in many cases helped you through a challenging situation or given you an advantage and being able to kind of pay that forward. That seems to be, that seems to be the kind of the long distance fuel, you know, like the, there's all kinds of shiny objects and different opportunities come up and there's always going to be a never ending need. Um, but if you can find that kind of personal passion, that's the, that's a long distance fuel that keeps you going over the kind of years and decades. Okay, so going into um, systems, I heard you like to create systems that can be put into place like within the organizations you like to work on. Um, so after you leave to these systems are there to do whatever project you wanted to do kind of thing. Um, can you tell us a bit about that or how you design them? What does a good system look like to you and why they're important? I am a bit of a spreadsheet nerd. Um, so I'm really interested in data. I like to validate things. Um, so yeah, I, I do tend to, and I think it comes back to working yourself out of a job, you know? So sometimes, for example, um, like I'll have a system that's part of our kind of strategic planning process, but also our kind of performance indication process that will have data sets in there or tabs in there that will look at things like what are our goals and objectives? How does the good work that we do align with sustainable development goals or, um, uh, truth and reconciliation recommendations or other kind of big concepts um, and then it will kind of dig into like a budget so it'll be like okay you've got five or six different areas can you quantify that your investment in dollars aligns with your values that you're trying to uh, advance so can you you know can you say oh this is interesting does our program do our program reflects the balance or does the money we spend reflect the balance we want to see in our in our principles or our values or our goals. So kind of tracking some of those kind of things. And then I'll look at things like work planning. So all in the same spreadsheet on different tabs, I'll look at things like, okay, you've got 20 staff or a hundred staff. All right, do this, does the staff time on a given week or a given year, does that correlate to your values? Does that correlate, cross correlate to the income and expenditure? So it's kind of just, looking at all those different data sets. Um, and also how do you then take this complex model with lots of different data streams and consolidate it in a way that you know a five-year-old could understand? Like if you can't take your plan and communicate back to your charitable board or your boss or whatever, 
on a single sheet of paper and say, this is what we tried to do. This is the indication that it's working with a chart or a graph or whatever. Um, then it's not, it's not optimized yet. And just keep layering it on and, uh, and sort of fine tuning those systems. Uh, I think, I think it's helpful. And I think maybe the most helpful thing is when you, when you've got a little bit of experience, but when you co-create those systems with your team, it provides a framework and a structure for your team to really kind of build into their practice really on a daily or hourly basis, remembering and reflecting on the values and goals. Because otherwise it's too common in organizations where, you know, some abstract senior leader creates a plan, but it's not, it's not in the muscle memory. It's not entrenched. It's not part of the everyday practice. And then it's suboptimal. Cool. There was a lot of awesome stuff there. I think it's a cool approach to make all those systems and tie like data together with values and everything for an organization. Um, for any youth who would be interested in social entrepreneurship, what advice would you give to them to get into it, to kind of prepare themselves for that? Or is there any advice you would just give to your younger self in general that you wish someone told you before? I think, you know, I think a range of experiences is really helpful. You know, so working in different sectors and uh, with different people in different places, like, you know, diversity breeds resilience. So I think seeking out diversity of experience is super helpful. Um, I think, you know, seeking out or actively seeking out those kind of development opportunities, those capacity exchange opportunities, you know, um, from individuals or organizations you normally wouldn't uh, interact with. I think that's valuable. Um, it's interesting. I, I went back. So I did an undergrad. I did a BSc. I qualified as a teacher. And then I went back and did an MBA. And it was pretty useful. And I'm glad I did it. Um, I don't know if I'd do it today. You know, I think, you know, I think sometimes we perhaps overemphasize formal kind of traditional uh, training and qualifications. I think probably get, I, I, think, I think you should really think carefully before investing those kind of time and money into some of those more advanced courses. I, I honestly think like just starting up, trying something, ideally in a safe space, you know, um, and just, it's just no substitute for personal experience. So, you know, even if you can access, and there's loads of opportunities now with the various grants and stuff like the Canon Service Corps grants, or even the student service grants that the Prime Minister announced today, take advantage of those opportunities to build a budget, try something out, fail fast, fail often, if you're gonna fail at all, um, great opportunities to kind of cut your teeth and try things out without, you know, taking out a bank loan and risking your own financial future. Yeah, really awesome advice. I, I really like the points about having experiential learning and getting like a diversity of experiences from that and also not being like scared to fail because you learn a lot from that as well. And I feel like a lot of people forget that. Um, but talking about experiences, was there any experiences that you had that really shaped you into who you are today or you think that are super important that anyone should get to help them kind of build that diversity of experience, whether it was like going on a specific trip or a job or something like that? Yeah, I think there's a few things. I wouldn't recommend all the experiences I had. Um, I would say, you know, so early in my career, I worked for a charity called Outward Bound and we led 21 day wilderness trips for youth at risk. And, you know, certainly for me, I think like spending extended periods of time, like weeks self-sufficient in wilderness is really instructive. It's not for everybody, but I sort of found that it gives you a lot of confidence. You know, I think it's, you know, if you, if you can spend that time, you know, with other folks in a shared setting, in a wilderness setting, that can be quite empowering. Um, uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe people who grow up in wilderness settings get that experience by living in a big city for a period of time. Um, but I think, yeah, I think time, 
in wilderness can be quite instructive. Um, you know, I've certainly had, a, you know, I've had a couple of sort of really big setbacks. Um, I, so in my twenties, I started a side hustle uh, with a friend of mine as a, a, a car rental company. So I had a little side gig doing car rentals, learned a lot about business. Um, after, and I sold my shares in that after a couple of years and my sort of former business partner went on for a few years and then went bankrupt in a very significant way. So I had some, anyway, a lot of that came back on me. And so there was some big financial setbacks. Uh, so I, you know, learned the hard way about making sure that, you know, documents are properly executed and signed and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's okay. You should expect to have some setbacks and have some scars, preferably not really big ones. Um, uh, so, I, you know, and similarly, you know, I, you know, had some challenging times with often in these programs and projects that you work on, you're working with these mission driven folks and they share your passion and your energy. Uh, so you work in really tight, close knit uh, communities. Um, and I have experienced, you know, some friends and colleagues that have really suffered been really challenged with mental health issues. Uh, and that, you know, and that's been really hard to process. Um, but, but the silver lining to that cloud is it just gives you a kind of an awareness and an empathy and compassion that actually helps you every day moving forward, you know, but the only way you really understand that is if, you know, you've had those kind of hard personal experiences and you've seen that kind of uh, trauma play out. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now we're going to be getting into the ocean side of things a little bit as well. Could you tell us a bit about OceanWise and things you're up to right now there, um, or like the organization in general is doing right now? Um, yeah, so that's our first question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so OceanWise is a relatively new organization. We, we grew out of uh, the Vancouver Aquarium. So we've got our aquariums work in Vancouver and Valencia, Spain and in Mexico. We've got our research and conservation action work. And then the division that I'm responsible for is the education and youth piece. So basically in the education and youth space, we try to create meaningful uh, opportunities in for ocean literacy and education youth development for four years of age up to 30 so we try to have this comprehensive approach where there's a good uh, cross-section of opportunities and development from young children to young professionals and we also try to have a range of opportunities um, that sort of build upon each other so there's a continuum from something that might be you know, an hour watching a webinar to all the way through to a 12 month fully integrated program for professionals. So we're trying to make sure that we have this comprehensive approach and that either we can connect people to the next step on their journey or we can facilitate the next step on their journey. Um, so it's kind of good. Um, we do that in a few ways. We have a children and youth program, and that's, you know, birthday parties, it's day camps, it's a teenager youth development program called Youth to See, where we uh, coach and support uh, teenagers in getting involved in conservation actions uh, and sustainability in their home community. Um, we have a curriculum programs, uh, area and so that's particularly working with schools and classes of teachers and right now they're doing a lot of video conference sessions we're just working on a thing so that teachers can come into the aquarium over the summer and record sort of virtual field trips so that in the fall if they're if COVID's still happening and they can't take their kids to the aquarium they've got like these pre-recorded YouTube visits where the teachers gone around and set them up um, we have uh, the online and ocean literacy area, uh, which is the webinars, it's the uh, asynchronous platforms, um, and it's the uh, and the 
most fun bit is these social learning programs where we get sort of groups of uh, maybe 10 groups of 30 youth globally to think about a topic and critically learn from and with each other. And they'll get some guest speakers and stuff to co-create something. Um, and then we have our mobile programs. We have a 28 foot truck and trailer where we take aquariums to classrooms and youth camps and other places. So that's, that's a big chunk of what we do. Um, and then we also have uh, our uh, young professionals program, Ocean Bridge. So that's where 18 to 30 year old Canadians can volunteer two hours a week in their community and we support them in visiting uh, and exploring national marine conservation areas. And we give them funding and support and stuff to work with the local community to identify a real need and make a difference. Um, so that's a lot. Uh, I could screen share, I suppose, that we have a, a website. Let me see if we can. So for anyone who hasn't visited, let's see whether this is going to work. Do you guys see my screen now? Yeah, so I won't go through it in detail, but basically this is a little map of where our participants are. You can zoom in on it and see what they were up to. And then these are the communities. So these are the, so if you clicked on this one, on your camps community, you might be a parent or a child and you want to see some pictures of what the camps are up to or whatever. If you click on the Ocean Bridge one, you'll see the young professional stuff. This piece here is where it's really a sort of digital textbook. So it's intended for young people to learn about the ocean in their own pay, at their own pace, in their own place, in their own language, in a way that's meaningful for them. Uh, and then if we click on some of these things, it's just got some nice pictures and stuff of what we're up to. So I don't know. here's a pic, I'll show you a picture, hopefully if it pops up. Yeah, so this is our aqua van that that, yeah, that was in Montreal that day, but this is this crisscrosses the country and it's got mobile aquariums in the back and does fun stuff. So, yeah, that's kind of, I don't know, that's a pretty high level overview, uh, but that's the kind of things we, we're doing every day. Yeah, no, lots of awesome stuff there. I think a lot of um, any of the youth that watch this now or watch this later on as well would be interested in a lot of like the youth team programming. Um, depending on their age group. I think personally, the Youth to Seas program sounds pretty cool as well. Um, but moving into kind of what OceanWise is trying to do, like bridge that gap of um, having that ocean education. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, as a whole, I don't think the ocean gets a lot of like the attention that it needs sometimes. We don't learn about it in school. Um, we don't talk about it as often as, like an example I would give from some of my carbon sequestration research is like we oftentimes talk about planting trees a lot as a solution to sink carbon, but the ocean is this huge carbon sink as well with the sea kelp forests and microorganisms. Um, but there's so many other things that the ocean does as well. Um, is there any key things you would say to anyone who doesn't know how important it is to protect our ocean and its role and also our climate? Big fan of uh, kelp forests and seagrass. We've got to get onto that. <laughs> the, it, it is a real challenge. Honestly, I, I spent, most of my career focusing on terrestrial or land-based kind of nature conservation, you know, OceanWise reached out and asked if I would be interested in helping them out. And I was genuinely surprised how underserved ocean conservation is. I would say that sort of three or four years ago was probably good timing, like um, the ocean plastics issue, which is obviously microplastics in the ocean is a big problem. And for lots of people, it was kind of like the gateway drug. It was like all of a sudden, it, a lot of folks around the world woke up and went, wow, there are oceans out there and they're perhaps in trouble. And, you know, we perhaps need to modify some of our behaviors. Um, I th so it was probably good timing, I guess, to get into the ocean space. I, I still think that the majority of people don't really understand their, the influence they have on the ocean and the ocean has on them and you know every second breath is thanks to the ocean you know <laughs> and so people don't think about it in those terms i think maybe the biggest challenge is you know really in the last sort of 300 years post-industrial revolution you know with the kind of advances of science 
many societies have really wrapped their heads around trying to understand the sort of technical aspects of ecosystems as opposed to the kind of social cultural aspects. So, and, it, and it's sort of often driven by the advances in science, I would say, uh, and, and a belief that the real challenge are knowledge gaps and that we don't know. Um, and I would say knowledge gaps are important and we should always continue studying and learning. I don't think they're the biggest challenge anymore. I think the biggest challenge chase, facing the survival of our species are not knowledge gaps, they're empathy gaps. Every five-year-old on the planet knows that climate change is real. So the question is, why can't we get society or governments or industry to modify what they're doing? So I think it's not that we don't know, I think that we don't care. Um, I think, you know, the more empathetic we can help people be and think about other species and think about the people that are going to come after us, the smarter decisions we're going to make, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's artificial to try and sort of separate it out. I think we've got to try and blend, you know, science with art, with music, with language, with culture, because really it's about attitudes and values. That's what drive behaviors. And if you look at societies through evolutionary time that have really done a good job of living in harmony with ecosystems, it's entrenched in their culture, you know? So, and that's where I, I really think that's fascinating, like trying to find whatever it is that people are passionate about, but that intersection of science literacy with, um, with our music and language and those kind of cultural aspects. And that's where I think we can make some progress. But yeah, a lot of really great points about that. Um, hopefully people will be more inspired to look into some more of that now because there's so much to learn about the importance of the ocean. Um, which is why I think OceanWise's work is really cool. Um, I had an audience member um, message me and say they're really interested in learning a bit more about the aquarium itself. I know I was there a couple years ago. It's pretty awesome. I saw some rescue otters. Um, I know you have a, like, a lot of rescues there. Could you tell us about kind of the direct work that the aquarium does in helping to protect the ocean? Um, and if you could share like any stories that are your favorite from even like visiting it or working there? Yeah, we're pretty fortunate. The Bank of Aquarium, uh, has been around for a long time, over 60 years. And so it's kind of interesting that when it was getting started, it was really early days. One of the things I think that was fundamental to its long-term success was the, the founding mandates were um, play a major role in education, generate original research and operate independently of government. So often with civic institutions like art galleries or museums or libraries or aquariums, the provinces or the, or the municipalities or some level of government subsidizes them. We've never had that. And I think that's really led to a kind of nimble, creative, more entrepreneurial culture in the organization. So I think it's, whilst sometimes it's easy to think, oh, geez, it'd be great if the government would just give us free money. But if they had done, we probably wouldn't have been as creative and innovative, I think. Um, the, so we do do a lot of uh, rescue work. So we have a marine mammal rescue team, uh, which is pretty unique in Canada. There are other rescue programs working with volunteers and helping whales in, in particular that are, get tangled in nets and that kind of stuff. But we do have, we're fortunate to have uh, full-time vets and uh, people in boats that can go out uh, uh, on the West Coast. Um, and because we were there before Department of Fisheries and Oceans, we do a lot of work on the West Coast that in other parts of Canada is done by the federal government and they just permit us to do that because we're professional in what we do. Um, the sea otters, for example, are great. We all love the sea otters. Everyone wants to rescue the sea otters. They eat about $35,000 worth of urchins and food each year. So they require a lot of food and it's expensive food. They're kind of fussy. So it's kind of interesting where along the West Coast from Alaska to British Columbia to Oregon, it's not uncommon 
for other organizations to rescue a sea otter pup or, or a sea otter that's in trouble and then kind of reach out to us and say, hey, we've got a sea otter. Do you want to take care of it? And, uh, you know, our vet team and most of our staff and our visitors thinks that's great. And then our accountants and, you know, CFO are like, oh, no, we've got to find another 35 grand. Um, so they are kind of, uh, yeah, they're great in many ways, but it can be challenging. Um, similarly, you know, we have, uh, we have a white-sided dolphin um, that was in a dry fishery in Japan and its pectoral fins are damaged, so it can't be released to the wild, so we take care of that. Um, and, you know, part of the evolution of understanding around animal welfare and changing standards and these kind of things. So we've now committed not to have uh, whales or dolphins in human care in Vancouver, and that's reinforced by the, you know, the legislative bodies. But it's challenging to find a new home because a lot of aquariums that, you know, uh, sort of more entertainment focused aquariums and some big ones in America, they want, they want like the cute, good looking animals. They don't want the damaged ones. So it's kind of going against us a little bit because we were always the home for the ones that needed our help the most. And sometimes it can be challenging because it's hard to rehome them when you need to. So it's, it's a complicated world. Um, probably the best example is Moby Doll. So, and obviously this is well before my time, but we were the first place in the world to have an orca whale, a killer whale in human care. And that was a fascinating journey of the public perception was that these were ruthless killers that were ferocious, that ate a lot of fish stocks, that were damaging fisheries. Um, and over a you know, decades of learning from and with these animals and studying them, the whole public perception around, wow, these are really sophisticated um, societies, these are, you know, the, the, just our respect and, and appreciation and understanding of those animals as a society developed massively. So we were the first place in the world to have an orca whale in human care and the first place in the world to say, we won't have orca whales in human care because of the journey we've been on and the learning and the development. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that's pretty interesting um, to just kind of always be open to an evolving view of the world uh, as new information comes up and new understanding uh, comes forward. Yeah, I definitely, I like that last point about um, having that evolving perspective too. Um, but another question someone asked was they're really interested in learning more about microplastics. Um, I know there's a whole section about that um, on the OceanWise website as well. Could you tell us a bit about um, microplastics themselves, um, why this is a really big, um, why it's a big problem? Um, and is there anything we can do to prevent this from happening? Yeah, so I mean, lots of challenges with microplastics. I mean, probably the biggest challenge was that for decades, we didn't, humans didn't really understand. You know, we treated the ocean like a big garbage dump and the sort of phrase in nature conservation that is, you know, the old thinking was that the solution to pollution is dilution. You know, so, so long as you spread it out enough, you know, you can't see, but anyways. So we've learned a lot about that and, you know, just, just how omnipresent, you know, from the deepest trenches to the Arctic, to what we consider to be pristine wilderness settings, it's everywhere, you know? And so we did that, humans created that, uh, those polymers, those plastics, um, and we have a duty of care to clean up our mess. Um, so very present, OceanWise has been a, quite a leader um, under the previous government, the national uh, research team that was working on ocean plastics was, the funding, funding was cut. And so we stepped up as a charity and hired the lead scientist, uh, Dr. Peter Ross and the team and bought the equipment and just kept that work going because we felt 
according to the values and mission of our organization, if the government wasn't going to do it, somebody had to keep doing that work. Uh, so we, we have got quite a big team uh, of people studying that all the time. And now they've kind of moved a little bit beyond essentially water sampling and mapping where is, what's the extent of the pollution. Um, now, we're, now they're looking at solutions like how do we help textile manufacturers design new textiles that don't dump microfibers from laundry into the, into the ocean or the waterways and eventually into the ocean. Uh, so getting into the solution space has been important and also looking at physiology. So we're doing a lot of research on it, like looking at microplastics in, for example, the stomachs of uh, beluga whales in the Arctic. So trying to understand what are the physiological implications, what does it do to the health of an animal, including the health of humans? If you're breathing microplastics and consuming microplastics all the time, whether you realize it or not. So we're, we're still on that journey and we and we've just, as an organization, our sort of cultural mindset is to focus on finding a better way and focus on solutions. Um, and we tend to not, uh, we, we tend to not do it as much of the kind of hard advocacy work. We don't do much work calling for new policies or uh, petitions or some of those things. We tend to focus more on creating jobs and opportunities and finding solutions and, you know, working in that space. Awesome. Um, yeah, moving back to the microplastics point, I, like you've heard this thing once that we eat like you could eat up to like a credit card worth every single week. That's like pretty crazy. So um, <laughs> we need to solve that area for sure. Um, one other question kind of related to like the solution area is just in general for more like the youth perspective, um, what could we do to help, whether it's with microplastics, with anything related to ocean conservation or protection, what are actions that we can take in our daily lives to do something? Yeah, I mean, there's lots. I think you mentioned earlier about climate change and really it's the whole, climate change is a whole ball. You know, microplastics, are, you know, are a big issue, but all of these issues are going to be irrelevant if we don't address climate change, you know, for our species at least. So, you know, being thoughtful and deliberate about, you know, transportation methods and, you know, minimizing flying, minimizing purchasing products that have been shipped a long way around the world. Um, anything we can do to mitigate carbon emissions is good. Uh, anything we can do, whether it's reforestation or anything we can do to support um, nature-based solutions is obviously a positive thing. And yeah, things like using uh, reusable shopping bags and stopping using straws and those kind of things to mitigate um, the plastic pollution, absolutely. I would say, you know, I mean, we have a number of programs. So, for example, um, we have the Shoreline Cleanup Program with the World Wildlife Fund and 70,000 Canadians every year get out and clean up beaches all across the country, freshwater, saltwater beaches. And that's great. Um, but it's also great that in doing that, hopefully you're meeting other people that share your values. Maybe that's where you find some of your tribe. You know, so I think those shared experiences making a positive difference in the world are really critical. Similarly, we have the Sustainable Seafood Program where we try to help people to make better decisions about the seafood they're eating and not, you know, not sort of trying to polarize and say, don't eat seafood, but say, be thoughtful about the seafood you eat because some of it can be quite detrimental to, and harmful to the ecosystem. Uh, resiliency and others are okay. So just trying to, trying to understand the world is shades of gray, it's not black and white. Yeah, great advice. And I had just had a message question. So what is your advice on how to talk about climate change? And this could go for like even just the ocean perspective. Um, to friends and family when they don't think there's anything that we can do as individuals to make a difference? It's a difficult one. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you know, I have quite a broad kind of range of friends and social uh, context. And, you know, I've got friends who are pretty skeptical about climate change. You know, and it's, 
it's always tempting to just, you know, dismiss them and, or, you know, think that they're perhaps not intelligent people, um, but they're a product of their environment, of their lived experience, of the other people they talk to. Um, honestly, I think, you know, working with youth is often the best path forward. You know, I think, again, through evolutionary time, you know, it's the adolescents. It's 14 to 24 year olds that have repeatedly saved the species. You know, there is argument to be made that in the last ice age, human beings survived because probably not because the old people or the young people or the young children like maintain the survival of the species. It was probably adolescents that kind of struck out from their ancestral caves and could see that it was evident that you know, they were going to die and freeze to death if they stayed there. So they struck out not knowing what they were going to find. They took chances and they found the ice bridge and human beings still exist. So I think, you know, there's a massive amount of power in the adolescence. You know, they're, they have a high tolerance of risks. They're socially very connected. They, you know, they're very innovative and they believe they can do something they do something that other generations can't. Adolescents are also always the driver of social movements, whether it's fashion or music or progressive worldviews. It tends to be the adolescents that, you know, for example, uh, you know, my grandparents' generation, there's a lot of, you know, entrenched bigotry and racism that, they grew up with. Whereas if you talk to most five-year-olds or, or 10-year-olds or whatever, they just think that's so ridiculous, they can't wrap their head around it, you know? So I, I just have a tremendous amount of optimism and faith that if we could empower more of our adolescents to be the change agents we need, the better the world would be. You know, one of my standard sort of rants is that, Say it took someone like me 20 years to be quite influential at a sort of national level. The people that come after me have to be better than, than I am in two years. And there has to be 10 times as many of them. So anyone who's in a, a, a sort of career trajectory or career situation like mine, my number one job is to give it away. My job is to open as many doors as possible to empower as many of the next generation as possible because that's, that's the best hope we've got for, for, you know, for our species on this planet. Yeah, I think that's a really great message to our viewers about the power that we can have together to actually make change in all of these areas. So the question was, what kind of lifestyle changes have you made that um, to help reduce your environmental impact um, that you would recommend other people doing? And I think you answer this a bit with some like big ones and straws. Is there anything else you've specifically done? I think, I think just mitigating travel, like, you know, and it's really challenging. Like we live in Canada. It's really cold in the winter. We're going to have to heat things. We're a big country that's spread out. There's going to be travel, but you know, all of our, I mean, certainly with COVID, this is a silver lining with COVID, like all of our, meetings within my team so we have a lot of meetings um, is are uh, online you know and have been for three years so we do stuff like zoom and webex and those kind of things um we uh we mitigate or we minimize air travel um we uh minimize uh, consumption of uh meat so we you know we try and have a partially vegetarian diet. So these are all things that aren't huge hardships. You know, these are comparatively small changes that anybody can make um, that, can, uh, that can collectively have a really good positive impact because the environmental degradation that we're observing right now, in many cases, wasn't caused by one or two really bad um, events or acts, it was, it's the tragedy of the commons. It's big numbers of people being a little bit complacent or perhaps thoughtless, 
that it, it's, it's the, the, action, the small actions of many, many people that got us into the problem, and that's what's going to get us out of it as well. Um, and is there any final call to action you would just like to give to any youth watching this today? I guess I would just say, if you haven't done so already, just Google the Canada Service Corps. So there's, that's 14 charities in Canada that are trying to create uh, positive opportunities for Canadian youth. Um, so I definitely look at the Canada Service Corps. We're one of them, but there's lots of other great organizations. Um, I'd encourage you to, to look at those opportunities.